I want to conclude the series today, one. We've been looking at the series one, and it's been good, and that we've looked at one from all sorts of angles. And uh, I want to conclude it today because next week, remember that we are at the Villa Marina for one, where all of our congregations gather together, and it's going to be uh, a really exciting time. We're going to have Peter Nembard with us to uh, preach up a storm, I'm sure. And, and so today, I want to finish with the message on one church. And we're going to look at uh, a couple of verses from the letter of 1 Peter. And Peter wrote um, something. But before we do, I, w- I want to do something a little bit differently this morning to maybe open our eyes. Um, can you smile at me this morning? Yeah. Oh, good, good. We're awake. We're enjoying him being in God's house. Um, and I'm going to ask Jess, wherever she is, Jess, to come and join me. Jess is our intern, just joined us from India. So can we give Jess a round of applause? And uh, I've just asked Jess to share something a little bit about her experience of church. And we're talking about one church today and what it's like in northern India. I'm sure you'll say where you're from, eh? Yeah, yeah I will. Okay, so Jess, over to you. So I'm from a city called Chandigarh, which is in northern India. It's quite a hard name, Chandigarh. But it, it's, um, it's part of the 1040 window across the globe. Um, if, you, if somebody doesn't know what that is, it's the um, region which covers areas with the most socioeconomic issues and the, the least openness, so the most resistance to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And... Um, and so my parents pastor a church over there, a small church. And um, oh, oh, actually, uh, quite recently, I was speaking to somebody from the island who's, who's been to India a few times. And he was just like, Jess, India is so dark. I find it so dark always. And he's quite true because uh, spiritually, you just feel the oppression. It's like the demonic, you know. Um, and you, you, you can feel that sometimes very tangibly. And there's a lot of mental kind of, oppression and also physical persecution in some parts and also um, uh, there has been you know there have been inc- incidents near us and uh, where, where we've kind of had situations where you just don't know who's going to show up when you're gathering so in the physical is like no protection um, in the natural because sometimes you meet um, but you can feel fear like I felt that myself many times when you, you're just sitting and you think we don't want the wrong people to just show up and kind of attack uh, because they just do that and you don't have any kind of protection. You don't have any help from the establishments to kind of give you justice. So you you really just depend on God and y- you have to depend on the Holy Spirit. And so, but the great thing is when we do meet, you just feel so much joy. And, and because you're very few, it's so important to actually meet so you can build each other up. And there have been, you know, places, uh, uh, sorry, um, times when you we've really felt that supernatural joy and just like angelic uh, hosts and like presence around when we worship. So it's amazing because God does move in power when you obey him and you just come together. So the battle is really intense, like spiritually, but um, that that is where you depend on the supernatural more. And you just obey him and you just gather, you know, and, and um, God, you just trust God, he'll keep you safe. So, yeah, that's kind of a little bit about India and northern India. Let's give her a round of applause. Eh? <laughs> you know, I, w- I wanted us to hear briefly from Jess because we're talking about one church this morning. And in some places in the world, and you actually meet someone in the flesh, they are under physical risk just gathering. You know, Jess is too humble to mention it, but her mum and dad, Baal and Nilma, who we know well because they've visited here, um, they have been at fear of who's going to knock on their door because there are people looking to get information about who's in the church. So when they have the opportunity to gather on a Sunday morning, their dependence on each other and on the supernatural is more than just, oh, it will be nice to go to church this morning, or it will be, it will be, well, do I fancy going to church? No, this is life and death, and the joy of gathering. I, I love what uh, Jess said there. The joy of gathering is that sometimes you have encounters with angelic hosts 
just because a few Christians in this place have had the courage to meet together. And I think sometimes for us in our context, is it not true that we too easily get rather comfortable with the privilege of being part of a church? And it's so good that Jess is here with us because um, I think she's going to teach us something about church over this year that she's with us. So um, do make her very welcome. Do invite her around. Do ask her because she was sharing some of her story with Carol and I when she came around the other day. Do ask her because she does it with such a, a lightness and a positivity and she's already a bundle of energy and uh, she's been a great joy to have around and that is in the context of someone who appreciates being able to be in a church. Does that make sense? So I think that was a, a great way for us to come into this subject of one church. And let's read the passage from 1 Peter 2 and just verses 4 to 5. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious. That's Jesus. As you come to him, um, you yourselves, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And from this passage and from Jess's testimony, I think we're going to learn three things about the very nature of the church and what it means to be one church. And um, we need to press on because of time. So the, the first thing that we need to learn is that one church is a home. We're living stones in a living building under construction. Paul wrote this in Ephesians 2, verse 19 to 22. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. It's a house. It's a home. Just like Peter said, you're being built up into a spiritual house. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, and on Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together to be a convenient place to meet up. No. You are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Christianity is community. Our true place, if, if you and I are going to find our true place as Christians, then we have to find it being built into this house. Being built together into a house where the presence of God can dwell. Do you know what? An individual brick is not a house, is it? If I put this brick down, I can't live in a brick. I can't dwell in a brick. I can't meet with others in a brick. A brick is a brick. And this happens to be my brick. <laughs> you know, I can't live in it. I can't support other bricks with it. It's effectively useless. I mean, it might prop a door open, I suppose. But it's effectively useless as a dwelling, as a place where someone can be in a home. It's not a house, is it? Does anybody want to live in my brick? No, you don't want to live in my brick, do you? And, you know, solitary religion and solitary Christianity is basically about as effective as an individual brick. Because we're called, as Jess was saying, to be together, to be a house. It's a contradiction in terms, in some senses, to say that I'm an individual Christian. I mean, Obviously, we are individuals, but the purpose is we're being built together. I was reading this a famous story of the king of Sparta. And the king of Sparta, he was boasting of the walls of Sparta. And he was boasting to a visiting king. And the visiting king said to him, well, where are these walls that you boast so much about? He's looking around. There were, there were no walls anywhere to be seen. And he pointed at his bodyguard, all his soldiers, and he said, these are the walls of Sparta. Every man a brick. 
And it's true in an army, isn't it, that any soldier is only effective by standing shoulder to shoulder with other soldiers. And that is how we are called to be, shoulder to shoulder, not individual bricks, but joined together. The people of God joined together. A brick is only ever useful when it's joined into a building to build something. And it's the same with any Christian. To realize our destiny, we need to be built into the fabric of the house of God. Rising up as, some, as a place that... Uh, you know, the difference between fruit and the church is fruit grows, doesn't it? The church is being built. And we are being constructed as each individual, living stones, as Peter called them, connected to one another into a spiritual house and a home. Individualistic Christianity is an absurd way of living. We are dependent on each other. We are dependent on each other. And that's the beauty of the church. We grow in dependence. Why come to church? Why come to church at all? Well, to support the bricks around me. It's our purpose to belong. We're being built into this house for God's very presence to dwell amongst us. You are being built, plural, Paul says. You are being built together into a dwelling place for God's Spirit. We come to church on a Sunday so that God's presence can dwell amongst us, can be here. Why be connected in community to a life group or sign up to an equip or come to the prayer meeting next Friday? What, why do those things? Well, to encourage one another, to correct one another, to see our gifts develop, to grow in devotion and to house the presence of God. And next Friday morning, we have the prayer meeting, 7.30 a.m. at Lock Prom Methodist Church. And then we've got the weekend, the equip weekend. Well, that prayer meeting... It's where we, we can be desperately coming together, seeking together to ask God to move amongst us and do the things that we long to see in the house of God. Amen. Amen. Sometimes people say to me, um, I won't say it's in here, but why become a member of, of a church? Well, I kind of feel like I almost want to say, well, why not? Why wouldn't you want to? Surely it's the best thing for you. The best thing for us is to know that we are being built together. I'm not going to be an individual brick stuck on my own, use, useful for nothing. I want to be built together with you. I want to give my heart to you. And I want to have your heart given to me so that we can come together. Does that make sense? The church, one church, looks like a home. It looks like a place where people are welcomed, where people actually love being together. I don't know what your house is like, but generally in our house, we love being together. And that's what a church should be like. That's what one church looks like. And I'll come on to why that's so important. But does that make sense, church? Yeah. Come on, we're not individual bricks. The second thing then that the church, one church is meant to be, is it's meant to be a bridge. We'll try a little experiment here, but I, we need to be quick and I need four flexible young men. So, Shem, Ed, you, you guys need to come. Corey, you can come as well. Who, who else is a flexible young man? Graham. <laughs> yeah, Graham, come on, if you're flexible, <laughs> do it. Quick, quick, quick. So, come here, guys. Graham, you're in, yeah. <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, let's have someone else then. Um, Dave will do. Dave Baker, yeah, yeah. So we haven't got much space, but we've got to try a little experiment here, which is, um, Ed, you know what you're doing here. So you go into a crab with your hands behind you like that. That's it. Now, Corey, what I want you to do is put your head on Ed's knees there and lift your legs up. That's it. That's it, you got it? Yeah, and now Dave or Shem, you put your head there. <laughs> and then, yeah, just move over a li li little bit this way. 
That's it. Now put your head back on each other's knees. I just want to tell you this worked in Switzerland. <laughs> right, has everybody got their heads rested? Now you can lift your hands. <laughs> yeah, it worked much better in Switzerland. <laughs> Yes, they, they need more space. But uh, yeah, so you saw that once they were connected to one another, then they became a bridge because I could have sat on them. <laughs> or, or perhaps gingerly crawled across them would be a better description. But you see, this is what we're meant to be. When we are joined together, we become stronger and we become a bridge. And the... The passage that Peter describes, he talks about us as a holy priesthood. Now, the word priest in the Latin is pontifex, and it literally means bridge builder. So as a holy priesthood, we have become builders of bridges. Now, in the Old Testament, they were dependent, weren't they, on professional priests. There was a professional priesthood that gave them access to God. The Levites and the high priest, he went into the Holy of Holies once a year. And they were a bridge between the people and the presence of God. But through Jesus, we have a new living way. And the access to God is now not dependent on a professional priesthood. We now have the privilege as individual Christians of drawing near to the presence of God. In fact, the word tells us to come with confidence. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace because instead of being dependent on a professional priesthood like the Levites, through Jesus Christ, each one of us is now a priest. We are a holy priesthood, Peter describes us as. Now we are all priests together. And this bridge is something that, as the lads bravely try to demonstrate there, has become a bridge to draw others to Jesus Christ. And there are two great characteristics, two important roles for a priest. And bearing in mind now what I'm saying, you, you see we're all priests now in Jesus Christ, yeah? And there are two things that a priest must do. The first thing is that the priest builds a bridge for others to come to God. The pontifex, the bridge builder. And as a Christian now, each of us has the duty and the privilege of bringing others to Jesus. Of drawing others to the one that we have found. The, the one who loves us. The, one, the, the, the love that we have found as priests. Our role is now to be a bridge to introduce others to this Savior and Lord that we have met in our lives. In 1812, Napoleon was fleeing from Russia with his army and they were facing this total destruction and they came to the Berezina River and um, there was no way across this river. It was in full flow, full flood and uh, they were all going to perish and in the end, what they managed to do to just escape was they built a floating bridge out of wood, ripping off wood from roofs, breaking up carts, and they managed to build this bridge using trestles out of carts and uh, wood from roofs and escape across the river. And that has become a, a significant tool in the military, is the ability to build temporary floating bridges that can be used to transport um, people across seemingly impassable chasms of water. And if you go to Seattle now, you'll see the largest floating bridge in the world. And it's made up of huge pontoons that are just connected to each other to go across the river. What would be the river in Seattle? The big one in Seattle anyway. <laughs> and that is a great picture for us, you know, because as we are connected, we are connected as a bridge to introduce others to Jesus Christ. But you realize we are a temporary bridge because this opportunity will not last forever. Because when Jesus returns, 
there will be no more opportunities to cross that bridge. So we are connected, as the guys were, as a temporary bridge across a chasm. And the, the purpose of that bridge is, as priests, as a holy priesthood, we are rescue, we're on a rescue mission. Like the army, like Napoleon's army, we're on a rescue mission to save as many people as possible. And this is what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 33. I too try to please everyone in everything I do. I don't just do what is best for me. I do what is best for others. Why? So that many may be saved. Our role as one church, we are this temporary floating bridge that is not going to be there forever, trying to rescue as many people as we can to introduce them to the only one who can bridge the gap between man and God, and that is Jesus Christ. Why do we have these new invite cards. You, I was reading, you know, they did some research on how people come to faith, how people come to know Jesus Christ. And the incredible statistic was that 86% of the people that were um, surveyed didn't come to Christ through an event or um, through watching YouTube. They came to Christ through an invitation from a friend fa or family member. And these things, we used to call them seed cards. I think we should call them bridges now. Because they're introducing those that don't know Jesus to encounter the Jesus that we know. Why do we have, we're going to have a Friends Day on the 2nd of December. Well, we're, we're going to invite our friends and we're going to focus the morning on um, bringing our friends to come and meet the Jesus that we know. Why do we do that? Because we're on a rescue mission, church. Why are we having the gospel choir? Why are we sending people on 412 missions across the, global, across the globe? I, I, uh, where's Harriet? Is Harriet Morris, is she out in the children's work today? Good, because I'm going to really big her up now. <laughs> I found out this week that Harriet, who works in one of the uh, finance companies, she this year has given every day of her annual leave to going on mission. So much so that she's having to actually pay back a couple of days. To, she's gone to South Africa and she's going to Brazil. Who, who else is going to Brazil? Amy and Cara. Cara's at the back there. You know, why, why do we do these things? Because we're a, a holy priesthood building a bridge to introduce others to Jesus. Where are you going to go on mission in 2019? Hands up if you've got a passport. <laughs> well, the good news is you won't need that because in January we're going to Birmingham. <laughs> why, why don't you and I think about where we're going to go on mission in 2019? Where are we going to take our floating bridge in 2019? We can do it here, but wh why don't we in engage our faith and say, you know, I can go to Birmingham because that weekend is going to be all about mission. That's a small church in Birmingham connected to Peter Nembard's church in Ark. And there's, it, it's a small church just um, planted there and trying to grow and seek to um, bring the gospel into that huge city, the second largest city in Britain. What an opportunity for us to take our bridge. And if we can't go, I wonder who we're sponsoring to go. You know, if we physically can't get there, could, could we, in our hearts, maybe sponsor someone else to go? This, this is an exciting opportunity. I love to see the, the, the bridge moving. And the second thing that a priest must do uh, is create a bridge through sacrifice, spiritual sacrifice, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. We have to continuously bring sacrifices, offerings, in the Old Testament, it was animal sacrifices, but the sacrifices of the Christian today are spiritual sacrifices. Our service to God is an offering. In everything we do, we're offering a sacrifice. And you know what? God desires the love of our hearts and the service of our lives. He wants the love of our hearts to worship Him and the service of our lives. The perfect offering, the perfect sacrifice of a Christian 
an acceptable sacrifice is to love God with all our heart and to fill the house that we're, we're in today with the fragrance of worship, acceptable worship, giving our, our best in loving Him and um, singing words of devotion to give Him praise and glory and then laying down our lives to serve Him. You know, I, I was thinking about this. I wonder sometimes whether perhaps the perfect offering of a priest, each of us being a priest, is to worship passionately one week and serve in the children's work the next week. That wonderful combination of singing, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. And the next week, serving the least uh, amongst us. That's an that's a s- acceptable sacrifice, isn't it? I love that. You know, because making salvation all about me as an individual is, is such an easy fit with our culture today. You know, emphasizing the rights of the individual and the needs of the individual. What do I need? And, and that's an easy fit with our culture. And, and hear me right, every salvation is an individual work of grace. But listen, church, your purpose in being saved is to serve in the body. That individual work of grace gives us the eternal life in Christ Jesus, forgives our sins, and is um, a miracle, a wonder the free gift of God that takes us from death to life. But the Bible teaches us that we are saved in order to be part of the body of Christ, his church. In Colossians 3, Paul writes, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Let your salvation give you peace in your heart because as members of one body, you were called to peace. You were called to that peace as members of one body. Members of one body, not autonomous individuals. The purpose of our salvation is partly about serving the body, making sacrifices, giving ourselves. 2 Corinthians 5.15 And he died for all, Christ, he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. We no longer live for ourselves As Paul was saying, I don't do what I want. I do whatever I can to see many saved. We offer our sacrifices, our worship, filling the house of God with his glory, lifting up the name of Jesus. And let's not ever come to the house of God with a half-hearted attempt at worship. Filling acceptable sacrifices and then we serve. The Christian makes himself an offering. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So the church, one church looks like a home. One church is a bridge, a floating bridge on a rescue mission, offering sacrifices, and then finally, and we'll finish here. One church is is a light. I love, I was introduced to a form of Japanese art called kintsugi art. And the the thing about kintsugi art is that when something is broken, like a jar is broken, instead of repairing it with like an invisible thread so that you can't see the repair, instead they repair it with like a bold out there bond of gold. And so this broken pot is reconstructed with gold um, connections joined together so that in itself the brokenness becomes a beautiful piece of art. And is that not a picture of the church? Each of us is a broken fragment. Jesus said, fall on the rock. Be broken on the rock. And then my jagged bits And all my brokenness, restored beautifully in Christ, is joined to your jaggy bits with the gold of the Holy Spirit, the gold of his presence. And suddenly, the brokenness becomes something beautiful that the world can look at and say, that looks like something different. And the father can say, look, that looks like my son. I can bless that now. We, as one church, are a message to the world of God's glory. 
Peter wrote, Christ is the living stone. People did not accept him, but God chose him. God places the highest value on him. And you know what the father really wants? Is he wants the world to love his son. And we are the embodiment of what the world is looking at. So if we don't reflect the glory and the beauty of Christ as in our oneness and our passion as priests, then the world is going to look at a, a pale reflection. One church reflects the glory of Christ to the world. To witness to the excellences and the mighty acts of God in his salvation. As the world looks at us, they say, God is amazing. I need to taste and see what those people are doing because that is incredible. It doesn't look anything like the darkness that I'm living in. Our lives, even more than our words perhaps sometimes, become a witness of what God in Christ for, has done for us. Beauty in brokenness repaired. You know, we're going to finish now. Perhaps uh, Becky can, can play. But why do we have an emoji party? I mean, goodness me, an emoji party. I'm 54. <laughs> why do we do something different on Halloween? Something that our children can be part of. You know, it's going to be probably messy on Wednesday. We're going to have hot dogs and there'll be children everywhere and it'll be a bit chaotic. But who cares? We do it because we're light. Amen. We are carrying the light in the darkness. My goodness me, Halloween. <sighs> the church is here to be the light of Christ. We're a light to the world. Listen to this. Here's another way to put it. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I've put you there on a hilltop, on a light stand, shine. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives. Be opening up to others. You'll prompt people to open up with God. As we shine, we will prompt others to open up to the salvation that is available in Jesus Christ. Is that not what we want? Amen. Open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. The wages of sin are death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. How generous is that? How generous is our Father in heaven that he would give his only son to be crucified by the very people that he loves so that we can be reconciled to him. And you know what one church is? One church is the thing that should point the world to that very act of generosity. Can you stand with me, church? One church with God's message to the world. Will you join your brick, your living stone, to the family. As we finish this series on one, I was just so stirred that it's led us to a point, you know, where our hearts are being called to be a representation of what the Father intended the world to see of his Son in his church. What's in your heart? What's the Holy Spirit sharing with you now? We're a home. We're a home for the lost and the hurting and the healing. As Jesus' church, we belong to him. It's not our church, it's his church. We're just co-laborers. We're just a holy priesthood devoting our lives to him, to be a bridge. Are there people who need to know him that are on your heart now? Who need to be pulled across that floating bridge 
that temporary bridge. Pray for them. Think about inviting them. And let's be a light to the world. Let's just sing that song, Jesus, name above all names. And I want to ask that this is the beginning of our response to devote our whole selves to him. Spiritual sacrifice. Lord Jesus, we thank you for salvation. We thank you that you died on the cross for me. Thank you that you bore my sins on your body. And I turn from my sin to live now for you. I say with my lips that Jesus is my Lord. And I believe in my heart that he was raised from the dead. And so I can know eternal life with him. Amen. 